Hello, today is May 1st, 2013. We're meeting today with Mr. Dale Erickson at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Dale, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Pleasure. Let's start out, if we could, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay. I was born uh, May 12th, 1932, uh, in a little community of Russo, R-U-S-O, North Dakota. It uh, doesn't even exist anymore, I don't think. It was even when I was a, a young person, it was pretty much a grocery store and a filling station and a post office. Okay. Uh, raised on a farm through the Depression. Uh, can, we can were you, fortunate, my parents. I'm sorry, Dan, right? could you talk a little bit about that? What, uh, I don't know if you have much memories of it, but uh, how, how your family was affected by the Depression. Yes, I was going to do that. Oh, sorry. Um, we were proud, my parents were very proud of the fact that they were one of the few families in our community that didn't have to accept what in those days was referred to as relief, public assistance. Mm -hmm. I did have some cousins that worked for the CCC, which was the uh, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. They planted trees and did a little make, make work projects that uh, the government paid them a little money for. Uh, we milked cows, so that was a morning and night thing. We did it by hand. And I've always liked to sing, and I think part of that was because my brother and I would, uh, we milked sometimes 20, 30 cows. And uh, that's quite a job, milking by hand. And we would sing and harmonize all oh, this song. Oh, I'm wow. sure we sang so loud the neighbors <laughs> could probably hear us. But uh, wonderful memories. I started riding horseback when I was five years old, bareback. We didn't have enough money to have a saddle. And my dad always laughed. We had a, a pair of horses. They were not saddle horses. In those days, horses were used to work and and the utility was that they did work and uh, but these two uh, horses we bought from a neighbor and they'd grown up all their lives together and they were just you couldn't separate them so my brother who was eight years older than me of course 13th time he'd take off on a gallop and the horse i was riding just stayed right beside because i couldn't control him <laughs> And my dad used to laugh and say there was more daylight between my, me and the horse <laughs> than there was around us. <laughs> but <laughs> hanging on by the mane and, and uh, riding at a very young age. And so all through uh, my youth, uh, riding horseback was a, a big thing. Uh, people talk about their pets. I had, later on we did, then get into the quarter horses and 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 pleasure horses and uh, that was a lot of fun on sunday afternoon my brother and i would uh, take a couple of our then quarter horses and and go meet neighbor kids and and we'd have races mm. and and i was very fortunate in those days i had the fastest horse in the neighborhood and, and i can remember we'd have these races and by then we had enough money so we had saddles and I can remember turning around in the saddle and looking back at the horses that were coming behind but we were always in in the lead I had the fastest horse yeah. and then we had always had a collie dog and when one collie dog died we got one that you couldn't tell the difference of and we only we never had but one name for that dog and it was Jimmy Jimmy was perpetual. Might have, <laughs> Jimmy might have died and a new Jimmy came along, but it was always Jimmy. And these dogs were tremendous. Uh, collies are, are great pets, but they're also uh, good with cattle. Right, right. And we milked these cows, and you could tell them, you could say, Jimmy, go get the cows, and he'd get out in the pasture, round them up, and bring them back. Wow. Huh. And uh, so that was, and then, um, I think I was uh, about, well, the next thing that was kind of significant was, of course, my dad felt, and that's the way it was in the community in those days, if 
the weather was such you could work in the fields, you didn't go to school. So pretty much I went to a one-room country school all eight years, wow. and that was the only one in the grade. So I can always tell everybody that I was the head of my class all eight years. <laughs> wow. And I went to school from the time it froze up in October in the fall till it thawed out like in April in the spring. And the last year that they thrashed, I was in fifth grade. If you can imagine, today people, my parents would have gone to jail for yeah, what they yeah. let me do. The neighbor kid and I were both big for our age. And it was during World War II, that would have been 19, well, if you're 11 in fifth grade, it would have been 1943. Last year they thrashed with the bundle teams, you know, and wagon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this neighbor kid and I took a team of my dad's horses in the wagon, and the two of us then were treated as a man. And in those days, the pay was $8 a day for the man and $4 for the wagon. So Bobby Hawksburg and I uh, split the, the thing for the man, each got four bucks a day. My dad let me keep the pay for the team and wagon, so I ended up with eight bucks a day. And when the thrashing crew was over and the work was done, I had enough money so I was able to buy a registered Hereford heifer. And by the time I went in the Army in 1952, I had over 50 head of cattle wow. from that start, all paid for, which was pretty good. When I, I was two years out of high school, and I had a herd of cattle. And then when I went in the Army, my dad and brother kept them on a share basis, which was customary in those days. People who didn't have enough money for some reason to buy cows would keep them for someone that did, and they would share the increase. In other words, in the fall when they'd sell the calves, they'd go 50-50. And uh, of course, my dad and brother kept them for me when I went in the service because the idea was I was gonna come back and go, and the three of us were gonna farm. Mm -hmm. I'm two years out of high school, I'd been four years out of high school when I got back from the service. Well, by the time I got back from the service, the land had all been kind of taken up. It was just almost instant how these farmers got big. And, and where in 1950-51, there was vacant land about everywhere around mm. there. By 54, there wasn't any. Mm. So it was obvious that it, the three-person partnership was not going to fly. And I had the GI Bill, so I said, that's okay. I'll go to college and you guys stay, continue what you're doing. So uh, they bought my cows from me and I put the money in the bank. And uh, probably the only kid I know of in college that had $18,000 in the wow. bank while they were in college <laughs> because I'd sold my cows. But uh, that was a, and getting back to that threshing experience. Yeah, please. You know, you took a, a quilt along. And everybody slept in the farmer's haymow wherever you were working that day or, or threshing for whomever. And uh, so here's Bobby and I, fifth graders, taking care of these 15, 1600 pound horses, feeding them, harnessing them in the morning and taking care of them just like, you know, the men did. We were playing a big, big person and uh, it was quite an experience. Wow. <laughs> wow. But, Anyway, uh, then in seventh and eighth grade, again, getting back to the old one-room school, you, you know, you just passed up until seventh and eighth grade. You just moved from one mm -hmm. year to the next. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. But in seventh and eighth grade, they had what they called standardized tests that the state put out. And in order for you to move forward, you had to pass those tests. And of course, the teacher knew the time frame that she was going to have me, you know, from freeze up till thaw out. <laughs> and we just covered the curriculum, whatever needed to be done. And uh, I don't remember how well I did on those tests, but I did pass and got out of uh, elementary, what they call elementary school now. We yeah. called it grade school. Right. And went on to high school. But uh, uh, that was kind of a unique uh, way of life. And this one-room school was about three-quarters of a mile from our farm. 
And one of the most pleasant memories I have about that is we'd two or three times usually in the course of the winter we'd have such a severe blizzard that you couldn't see the barn from the house. And of course those are days we wouldn't go to school. And uh, invariably my mother and I, after we went out and did the chores, so to speak, yeah. milked the cows yeah. and did all those things, uh, my mother and I would, uh, oh, we'd make donuts and lefts, uh, mm -hmm. we'd cook the rest or bake the rest of the day. And so uh, those days were uh, especially enjoyable. Yeah, oh, that sounds wonderful. And uh, uh, unique, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, so that was pretty much it then through high school. In those days, of course, they didn't have buses. So, and it was 12 miles in from our farm to the high school in Velva, North Dakota. And so I rented room and board from a family and would stay there Sunday night through Friday noon. And I remember the first year, I think we paid them, or I paid them $38 a month. Hmm. for room and board Friday night through Friday noon. And of course, you know, I was self-sufficient because it all stemmed from that uh, uh, thrashing, operation. thrashing operation. And my dad believed that if he allowed me to do these things, then, you know, I could pay my way. Yeah. And one of the things that was so interesting, I think it was after my sophomore year in high school, uh, my dad came to North Dakota from a little town of Hendricks, Minnesota. It's southern Minnesota. And uh, he and my mother wanted to go down and visit uh, after spring's work when we had the crop in. And so I wanted to go along too, but somebody needed to stay home and milk the cows. And so I was ended up, I made a deal with my dad. If he'd let me put in this particular field into flax, uh, I'd stay home and milk the cows. Well, that turned out really well. I can remember it was planted Walsh flax, W-A-L-S-H. It had a very large, dark kernel. And this crop yielded very well, uh, about 20 bushels to the acre. And it was a 20 acre field. So I got about 400 bushels out of that. And that fall, flax was $7 a bushel. Wow. $2,800 was huge. Yeah. at that time. And I plowed it back into my farming operation, except, you know, I had to pay my own way through. My dad said, he, you know, you've got these opportunities. You can use the equipment, the farm equipment. You can use the land was of no value. It yeah. wasn't even thought of. Yeah. There was just all kinds of land available. So, you know, basically I put myself through high school in that manner. But uh, that flax crop was, was, uh, Quite a bonanza. Wow. And so, uh, of course, I took vocational ag and uh, a very wonderful uh, instructor, Lloyd Nygaard. And uh, my freshman year in high school, uh, the state uh, dairy association held a uh, dairy show in Jamestown, which is East Central North Dakota. And uh, all of the VOAG, uh, vocational ag uh, departments in various high schools sent their uh, dare judging team to that show. And of all things, I won first prize in the state dare judging contest. Well, the reward for that was, and big deal, uh, the, the dare judge, state dairy judging team consisted of the top four finishers at that uh, dairy uh, convention or show. And uh, because I was first, Mr. Nygaard got to be the coach and we drove his car and uh, traveled to Waterloo, Iowa. Wow, what a trip <laughs> for a guy that had never been more than 25 yeah, right, miles. Oh, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And... Uh, I have no recollection. I, obviously, I didn't do well or outstanding at this, but it was a quite an event. One thing I do remember that was humorous, and I guess I'll always remember. Uh, in those days, the biggest uh, decision you made when you bought a car was whether you got it with a radio or not. That was what air condition was not even yeah. thought of. Yeah. 
And uh, so Mr. Nygaard's car did not have a radio in it. So we're driving in the fall, you know, early fall, October probably. And this is quite a trip. And so we're telling jokes and, you know, talking. And, and Mr. Nygaard was, of course, Nygaard was Norwegian. He, he could speak Norwegian because most people of his age at that time, their parents probably spoke it more than they did English mm -hmm. when they're in their home. And so I got on the subject of language, and I can't remember which one of the other three fellows was kind of a little wise guy. <laughs> and Mr. Nygaard asked, could anyone speak any, any uh, foreign language? Oh yeah, uh, this young fellow says, I can understand anything but Greek. So Mr. Nygaard got a big smile on his face and said something to him you know, a sentence or two in Norwegian. He said, okay, what did I say? The kid said, I don't know. He said, it sounded like Greek to me. <laughs> <laughs> so that would have been uh, probably about 1946. <laughs> it's still a vivid memory. Yeah. But uh, uh, FFA was a uh, Future Farmers of America. It was a big deal. Highest level you could get in the state was a state farmer. And then if you went on to national level, you become a, a national farmer referred to. And uh, we used to go to um, North Dakota State, or was then called the uh, North Dakota Agricultural College in Fargo. And they'd have the FFA convention there every, every year. And there were offices in it, you know, like any organization. And, and I do remember that I went through those various offices and and was president of our chapter. Wow, uh, yeah. I, I, can, I can recall that. Yeah. But uh, Mr. Nygaard was a, had a huge impact on my life. Yeah. He was wow. just the most wonderful person, somebody that uh, you had to admire. He had great discipline in his classroom, yet he never disciplined anyone. He just carried himself in such a way that he'd never had a problem with discipline. Mm -hmm. People just respected him that yeah, much. Yeah. And he would advise me, then you would raise, you would have projects. Some people might raise chickens or pigs or whatever. Of course, my crown uh, jewel project was the flax that year yeah, I was right. a, <laughs> a sophomore. No one else in our chapter uh, had uh, that type of success. What, what made you think to, to grow flax? What, what prompted well, you? Well, to... the interesting thing about growing flax is in those days, you could put it in very late. So you could put it in, like, I think I planted that around mid-June. Hmm. And uh, uh, we, I remember we had a huge rainstorm and it beat the, the plants down and, and actually contemplated working it up that it might have ruined it. but. We didn't and let it go. And of course it came through with a 20 bushel of the acre crop, which was fantastic. <laughs> but, uh, and, and we put in shelter belts, you know, trees in the fields to reduce erosion by mm -hmm. wind. And it also collected a lot of snow, which was very helpful from a moisture standpoint in the spring and, and caused us to do what is known as contour farming where you plow kind of around the hills rather than straight up and down the hills. And that way, when it rains, there wasn't any furrows for the water to rush down the hill and, and erode dirt out of it because the water had to go over the side of each furrow, so to speak. Now that, that prompts the question, were you guys, uh, did you get much of the winds from the, from the Dust Bowl? Did they get that far north at all? Did you have trouble oh, yeah. with it? There's a lot of fence rows up there to this day. You'll see posts sticking out of the ground and, and some fencing in the dirt because the fence were so, uh, mm. the, there's so much dirt blowing that it actually covered up some fences. Wow, wow. And uh, so uh, that was uh, my, you know, my pleasant memories growing up was, uh, of course, that thrashing event, that was a, Really big thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. For fifth grade. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, riding horseback. And I do remember my brother and I went down on the Indian reservation. And you could buy uh, horses from them for $5 a piece. They'd have a roundup in the fall. 
and and our our neighbor had a cattle truck that would hold about seven or eight horses probably so my brother and I uh, bought however many we could get in this truck at five bucks a piece and they're nice looking Mustangs you know but spooky and uh, so we'd break them in the winter and the way we'd it was easy to break them you know in the low spots the snow would be so deep we'd lead them out in those snow spots where the snow was up to their belly get on their back and make them uh, ride well they'd be so worn out finding the snow and all by the time we, they'd get out of all those snow banks with us on their back they forgot all about Bucky <laughs> but the thing that I'll never forget the beautiful sorrel which is a kind of a light brown color had a had a what they call a star had a white like a star between its eyes kind mm -hmm. of a beautiful horse and I had this horse really well broke but when spring came turned him out in the pasture because now we didn't do anything with horses anymore we had equipment uh, tractors etc and so one Sunday my brother and I decided we we're going to go horseback riding so we rounded up the horses and I brought that horse in and I can still remember uh, it was customary you just take the saddle like in your right hand and walk up by the horse and throw it up on the horse well I guess I tickled his leg a little bit when I walked by and he kicked that saddle right out of my hand so now I know he's a little spooky but I got him saddled up and all and, and so you could just know he's going to buck and I think I might at that age have been in eighth grade maybe and so my brother had a horse that was well broke and so we just left the halter on this one I was going to ride and put the halter rope pretty short around the horn on the other well it wasn't short enough apparently and I got on that horse and he started bucking and we had a barn that was like the hay mow in the middle and like two lean-tos it would the the roofs would slope up and then it mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things I'll always remember about that of course I didn't stay with the horse all that long but I can still remember he flipped me up in the air and, and I turned and I could remember looking up that barn roof from upside down <laughs> and of course it knocked the wind out of me when I landed on the ground <laughs> But my dad became irritated with that horse and he went over and kicked that horse in the belly and my dad very seldom ever rode. He said unhook that, unhitch that uh, rope my brother had and he took that and he kicked that horse in the belly about three or different times I think took the wind out of practice, got on that horse and he never bucked a bit with him. So he said okay get on and ride and I got on and we went riding the rest of the afternoon and there was no more bucking but he, that, that was typical of what we call those Indian ponies. Okay. Yeah. But we break them out, you know, have five bucks in them, maybe get 20, 25 bucks later in the fall when, or the next year when when we could show them pretty good and they looked like they were pretty well broke. Well, you, you were quite the entrepreneur back in the... Uh, yeah, we were always uh, trying to make a buck. Yeah, you know? yeah. But, now, uh, you, you mentioned your brother. Is just the two of you or do you have other siblings? I had two sisters and two brothers. Okay. My brother was uh, eight years older. And he died very young from cancer at mm. 59. And it's very easy for me to remember that because this summer, my oldest grandson, Brian, will be 30. And Brian was born the 12th of June that year. And my brother died, I think, the 8th of July. So I could always remember. Yeah. But that's a long time ago. Yeah. And then my older sister died nine months later from cancer. So my poor parents went through two episodes of losing their children. Yeah. And I always said, you know, no parents should have to outlive their children. Yeah. But uh, so that was sad, so sad things about my yeah. life. What was uh, during the, the war years uh, with your brother older? Did your brother have to serve or did he? No, he, he fell in that little vacuum between World War II and Korea. So he never was in the service. Oh, okay. Okay. And he always felt kind of guilty about it, I think, and, and kind of uh, revered the fact that that I did spend that mm. time in service, but there was never much talk about that yeah. at all. But yeah, uh, right. So then I graduated uh, from college. And well, let's back up. Uh, what year did you graduate from high school then? 1950. 
1950. <clears throat> and then uh, went, on, went on to college? No, then I was out of school two years and farmed. Okay. Then I went in the military for two years. Got back in 54. I was, uh, you know, 22 uh, years old when I started college at Minot. Went two years there and then transferred to the University of North Dakota and got a degree in accounting, which I never practiced. <laughs> um, and also got married in that course of time. And uh, Minot was very good to us. We, we had a nice life uh, there. Uh, but I transferred to the University of North Dakota for my last two years. And it was kind of interesting. Um, when I graduated in the fall of 1957, U.S. Steel kind of liked the University of North Dakota accounting graduates. So they would come there and interview every year. And they would write a letter to the dean of the commerce school, uh, or the head of the accounting department, and ask for the names and addresses of the top 10 in the, in the graduating class. And they would come in the fall and interview. And I was fortunate enough to get a letter from them and, and was interviewed by them. And they wanted to hire me for fifty-four hundred dollars a year, four hundred and fifty a month. And that, I mean, how, was that a, a good wage back then? Well, it was a going to, wage. Okay, for, going, okay. Well, I thought I was worth more. I was a little older. I was a veteran, and and I'd worked my way through college in this clothing store. The last one being Sam Silverman's in Grand Forks. Some of the people will remember that. And uh, I was did very well in sales in the store, and and. Uh, so I thought, you know, that I was, I said I would go to work for less than 500 a month. Well, needless to say, uh, U.S. Steel didn't change their hiring practice for me. <laughs> and I was too stubborn to change, to accept theirs. And so I graduated three and a half years from college. Um, so I graduated on the 1st of February, 1958, and took a two-week uh, course, crash course in Fargo on insurance and started in the insurance business about the 10th of February 1958. And one of the things I always felt good about was in the course of that 10 and a half months, I made $6,750. So I, <laughs> I did better than what I asked for and considerably better than what U.S. Steel offered. And I had that business for 32 years and left Minot in 19... Uh, 90 and moved down here and uh, so uh, that kind of covers me through college i guess well let's back up now let's back up and uh uh i take it you were drafted then i or, was yeah you know, i had a u.s in prefix in front of my uh serial number and uh, if you had a u.s you were a draftee and if you had an ra that stood for regular army, and that's for people who volunteered. Yeah, yeah. And we used to have an expression in the service, you know, if you were a guy who, the term was gun gun ho, you know, yeah. you were in a, doing a lot of things. Well, they were referred to as whether they were drafted or not. We called them RAs, and uh, uh, you know, we'd laugh, and if we didn't want to do something, we'd volunteer. We'd say, well. Don't ask us to do it. We're not RAs. <laughs> and so uh, that was uh, the differentiation there. Yeah. Now, could you have gotten a, a, a agriculture deferment? I might have, but I was of the opinion, and tell you the truth, you know, I was just a kid during World War II. I really had this burning curiosity about war. Mm hmm. And uh, needless to say, afterwards, I wish I hadn't learned about it. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so I turned down a deferment for two reasons. I thought, well, I might as well get it out of the way. Yeah, yeah. And secondly, you know, we didn't know how long the war was going to last, the Korean War. So anyway, I went in and uh, was in 21 months and nine days. <laughs> so uh, you get your draft notice. How long after you got your draft notice then did you, did you take off for, for basic oh, probably. training? 30 days or less. Yeah. And yeah. Where'd you go then from, uh, where'd I you took go from? my uh, basic training in Camp Breckenridge, Kentucky, which is about 40 miles from uh, Evansville on the island. 
And, and, and how was that? How was that transition going from civilian life to, to military life for you? Was it? Uh, I don't know. It was fine. It, we had a lot of, you know, basic training is not a, a big social thing, but, you know, a bunch of young guys. We had a lot of fun together. Yeah, yeah. We'd pull dirty little tricks on everyone, you know, in the barracks and, <laughs> and things like that. It, you know, it was fine. I enjoyed it. Do, do you think uh, being a farm boy, you had an advantage over like the city boys in, in that regard? Uh, I think to some extent, uh, I would say more than anything else, the uh, the service and so many other organizations, business organizations, love to hire people from the upper Midwest or Midwest because they seem to have a good work ethic. Yeah. They were courteous and trustworthy. And, right. And those kind of people had a great reputation in those days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you took your uh, basic down in uh, Kentucky and take your story from there. Where'd you go from, from there then? Went to Korea. Oh, right away. Okay. A yeah. funny, little bit of a funny story here. <clears throat> uh, I was invited to go to uh, officer candidate school. And that was an optional thing because if you went to OCS, as it was mm -hmm. called, uh, you had to re-up for two years after you graduated. Well, it ended up, we got put on a little hold thing, so they called it a leadership school for like six or eight weeks. And the interesting thing is, and I don't remember the guy's name, but alphabetically, he was the guy ahead of me. And in the course of time in this leadership school, he, he made little screw-ups, like he did, you got two pair of boots, and you're supposed to, wear them every other day and shine them that night. Well, he got the idea, and I guess lots of people, other people did too, that it was easier to just change the laces because they're laced differently so they'd know whether you changed your boots or not. So at night, he just changed the laces in his boots and that way he didn't have to shine his boots. Well, he got caught on that. <laughs> and then it was a big no-no if you got caught on inspections, if you're, they'd reach inside like this jacket and if your your uh, shirt pocket was unbuttoned, that was a gig you would get. Well, anyway, this guy actually probably should have flunked out of that leadership school because he goofed around too much, but we all covered for him and pulled him on through. Well, by that time, there was so much time, I didn't want to spend another two years yeah. after spending 90, another 90 days at Fort Benning. And so I said, nope, I'm not going to do this. And he, of course, didn't do well enough. He he wasn't going to get to go to the uh, OCS school. So the orders came down. And in those days, a few people were going to Europe and then the rest went to what we call FECOM, the Far East Command. And don't you suppose the line between going to Europe and FECOM was between me and the guy ahead of me. And he's the guy that we worked so hard to keep him from flunking out. If he'd have flunked out, I'd have gone to Germany oh, instead of Korea. Oh, oh. So I guess that's the way it was. Oh. That was the way it was meant to be. Hmm. Did you have a, a furlough on your way? Yeah. At home uh, and stopped and... We, we, I uh, shipped out of uh, Seattle. And uh, uh, so, of course, I think I got a 30-day furlough maybe between, or two-week probably, travel time, they called it, mm -hmm. between you know, Kentucky and Seattle mm -hmm. and went home for that. <clears throat> then we shipped out of Seattle. On uh, ship, a ship or air? By air? Oh, no, by ship. Oh, well, let's, oh, uh, that, oh, that's no. going to beg the question. Here's a farm boy from landlocked North Dakota going to see, uh, did you get your sea legs? Talk about that journey. You know, I didn't get seasick. One of very few. Huh. And, uh, but one of the things that I'll always remember that was quite uh, humorous uh, you know, it wasn't a fun day when we shipped out. You know, first of all, we're going into war, into light unknown. weapons infantry, yeah. into war. So you don't know what your chances are of survival is even going to be. And your farm boy leaving home for the first time, you yeah. know, really a, yeah, a right. big deal. Yeah. So anyway, I remember as the ship started just inching its way away from port, and in the course of loading it, uh, the Army had a little band uh, playing. And uh, as we were just slowly moving out, you know how slow a boat ship is when they're leaving port, 
the, probably one of the most popular songs at that particular time was Teresa Brewer was the uh, artist that had the best one. And it the name of the song was Till I Waltz Again With You. And I can remember as I'm slowly leaving port thinking, well, you know, I may never, I'll probably never hear this song again because A, I could go over there and get killed and B, if I didn't, by the time I get back, you know how songs change. So I thought, I'll never hear this again. Well, two weeks later, we docked into Yokohama, mm -hmm. which is right next to Hiroshima where the Bamono, from the ship, we could see the ruins and the really? twisted girders wow. and all wow. that stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, as we pulled in, just inched in there, the Army had a little Japanese band playing. And don't you suppose the first thing I heard when I got there was, Till I waltz again with you. <laughs> <laughs> this little Japanese band. So I thought it was kind of humorous. I never expected to hear it again. And here two weeks later, I hear it as I'm... So we were in Japan for maybe two weeks and then moved on to Korea. Now at this point, are you going over just as a replacement soldier or were you oh, already yeah. in a unit? Uh, no, this was, you know... New fodder, so Okay, to speak. yeah, right, yeah. yeah. And uh, we landed at Pusan, and that's, that was a kind of funny story there. <clears throat> I can remember, if I recall, I think it was a Sunday, late in the afternoon, we debarked the boat, and there was an old train, I mean, that was going to take us north, you know, up to where the front lines were. It didn't have windows in it, and... And by golly, it was cold. Well, we'd gotten off the ship on the Sea of Japan, you know, is warm. And and the Army authorities didn't tell us that we're going to run into cold weather. We should put our long johns on. Well, we start heading north on that train, and pretty soon everybody's teeth are chattered, and it's so darn cold. Of course, the only alternative you got is to get in your duffel bag and get your long johns, but to get them things on, you got to take all your clothes off when it's darn cold, you're about freezing. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, somebody decided, oh, to heck with this, and they started diving for their long... Well, you never saw so many people get naked and get into their <laughs> winter underwear in such a hurry as we did because we were all freezing to death. So we got up north there and got reassigned, and... I ended up in A Company, the 17th Regiment of 7th Division, and stayed there the whole time while I was in Korea. And, and roughly what time period was that when you got into... Uh... I spent, uh, I got there about the first of, Je of the year, 1953, and the war ended the 27th of July. Okay. So I didn't get a full year, but I did get... If you spend, I forget how many days a month on the front lines, you got four points, and you could rotate home with 36 points, nine months. And, uh, uh, of course, July was the seventh month, so I was up like to 28 months in points. Well, after the war ended, they did, discarded that, so I ended up staying there until the following March. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, so I spent, you know, over a year in... in Korea, but I, I was happy enough to take the lesser points and, yeah, <laughs> and right. have the war in. Yeah. Well, but, talk about, uh, it, let's take your story then from taking that train up to, to the front. What, what's going through your mind then? I mean, you're, you're, you're basically going into harm's way. What goes through a person's mind as you're, as you're heading up there? I mean, well, I think it's kind of like a lamb being led to slaughter. You don't have any idea what's going to try to fire. So, you just assume other people have done it, so you know you'll do it too. Um, I did, I ran into a guy who was from Texas, and he was, he'd been there in Korea before his brother was killed in Korea, and he volunteered to go back because he had a kind of a vengeance. Yeah, right. And he was a master sergeant, the highest rank non-com you could get. And we got acquainted on the ship, and he says, ah, I said, you come with me. He said, I'll show you the rope. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we concocted a story that I was going to be his nephew, and he told me all about his family. So every time we got to a place where they would reassign, he'd go ahead and talk to him about his nephew. Well, I'd taken heavy weapons 
training, which is, uh, you know, uh, mortars and, and artillery. Well, I could have, if I'd have kept my mouth shut and hadn't concocted this idea, I probably would have got to stay back <laughs> in the rear. <laughs> right, yeah. But instead, <laughs> I ended up going up to the front lines with him. And then uh, there was two battles from Porkchop Hill that I was engaged in. There were the only two big ones. And uh, this one uh, was in on Monday, Thursday of 1953. That's... And uh, he was wounded in this one and takes back to Japan for care. And so he never came back. So now I'm up there and I don't have, quote unquote, my uncle with yeah, me. Right. <laughs> it was so funny because he enjoyed the rank that he did, highest possible uh, non-com rank. Even the regimental head uh, commander, colonel, knew who he was. And somehow or other, the rumor got around that I would, and these higher ranking people would come up sometimes and visit our positions on the line, and they would ask me how my uncle was doing in the car. I went along with the gag, I'm here. Well, you know, as far as I know, he's doing well. It was, so you talk about talking when you should have been listening. I, yeah. I certainly <laughs> talked myself into a frontline situation just because I was going to go up there with him and don't you suppose I got weaned rather young. Yeah, right, right. So uh, that was uh, kind of interesting. Well, talk talk about life up there on the, on the front lines. So. Well, it, it was a nighttime thing. The Chinese didn't have as good of equipment as we did, so to kind of level the playing soil, they, playing field, they never fought during the day. It was always night fighting. Yeah. And uh, so when daylight came, we'd have one guy that would stay awake that particular day and just make sure no one came and called on us. And the rest of us would sleep during the day and then he'd be up all night. And, uh, but uh, getting back to uh, that April, uh, we went up, the Chinese had, taken over about a third of the hill. And so our company was sent up there with the idea of counterattacking and ousting them out of that position, and which we did. And we lost about 40% of our, mm. our uh, unit. And when I say lost, I don't know how many of those were killed and how many were wounded, but there was Still, left. Right. Out of 140 men, there were about 40% or about 60 who were either killed or wounded, mostly mm. wounded, I think. And um, then we took it back on on Monday, Thursday, and held it until Sunday, Easter Sunday, and then we were relieved and went back to the rear. And a funny little story, and I guess it isn't all that funny, but it's funny the things you remember. Uh, on Porkchop Hill, it was quite a big hill, and uh, we used to have what are called APCs, Armored Personnel Carriers. They were a little bit like, they are a track unit, and they had an open top, so you weren't protected for anything coming up, but they would transport, so we were trucked to the base of the hill, and then we were loaded on these APCs and went about two thirds of the way as far as they could go up the hill and then we were unloaded and, and walked the balance of the way to the apex of the top of the hill. Well, we unloaded, unloaded from these trucks and were walking along side, you know, two men abreast. And as we're walking along, there's a chaplain on each side giving uh, uh, absolution to everybody as they walk by and I can remember turning to the guy next to me as we passed by I said you know there's something about this that just doesn't bode well <laughs> <laughs> and we both kind of laughed about that but uh, that was an experience I can remember very vividly hmm. and then uh, from there we kind of get to that deal where I was alluding to about the USO program. Oh yeah, please tell that story. That's a wonderful story. Yeah, this this was, I think, the week following our getting off Porkchop after Easter. 
But Piper Laurie was a uh, uh, movie star at the time. And she came over and did a USO show. And our company was marched up there as were, you know, hundreds of other soldiers. And they had a makeshift stage out on a hillside, basically. And uh, at, towards the end of her show, she had an Easter bonnet and she was going to put that on someone and sing the, the put on your Easter bonnet with all the frills bonnet, that song. And don't you suppose she selected me out of that audience? And <laughs> so she brought me up on stage and put that goofy looking bonnet on me. I'm in my fatigues, probably unshaven. And, and she's got her arm around me singing that. And, and it made the front page of the Stars and Stripes. And, and as I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, I, I've lost track of that, but I'm going to make every effort to go back to the archives and see if I can find that. Sure, because yeah. I think it's an interesting little story. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So uh, that was, a, I guess, the social highlight of my year. Yeah. And then the next thing that was great was R&R &R in Japan. Spent a week in Japan on R&R. &R. Went to Kokura, which is called the Garden Island. And about all there was in Japan at that time, they were starting to rebuild, was about, on every block there was about three what they called a uh, uh, cabaret. And basically it was a hotel bar combination and, and uh, uh, that's where the GIs would hang out, go and make their, their uh, deal for accommodation and, and uh, it was kind of interesting. You fly in, <clears throat> and uh, and this base area, and you go in at one end of this building, take off your fatigues and combat boots, go through the shower, and come out at the other end, and they give you a Class A uniform. When you go back, you just reverse it. <laughs> you dump off your Class A uniform, and you're back in your fatigues, <clears throat> and uh, of course get uh, your uh, money uh, exchange for yen <clears throat> and of course we didn't get US dollar we were paid in what was called military script it was uh -huh. like monopoly money mm -hmm. but you take your military script with you and when you got there they'd exchange it for yen and the exchange rate was 360 yen to the dollar and we all lived pretty high on the hog for that week I can remember I took $500 along with me because, you know, on those hills in Korea, you couldn't spend a dime. Yeah, right. So I had a little money saved up, even at $50 a month. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, we got $50 a month combat pay too. If you spend any time on, on up on the lines, and it, I was a sergeant by that time, and I think my pay was around $50 a month. but. For people who were less than a sergeant, they got more money for combat pay than they did for their pay. Hmm. But you know, we and you could get a quart of you get two quarts of your favorite alcohol, vodka, whiskey, or whatever you wanted per day. And I think at the PX they were like a dollar and a half a piece. Uh, so we would. I can remember one of our uh, forms of entertainment. We get up in the morning, go down and and hire rickshaws. And uh, they would uh, uh, run us all around town and see the uh, scenes. And <clears throat> of course, uh, there was an awful lot of time spent uh, in the bars and uh, spending time with the uh, uh, little Japanese, uh, uh, some of them were, I think sometimes they were called Gucci girls, if mm. I remember. Uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> that was how, how, how was the interaction with you and the Japanese? I mean, five years ago we were, five years earlier we were arch enemies. I mean, how was the interaction with the? Uh... Well, the Japanese, of course, were very uh, courteous, bow and everything, and uh, there didn't seem I didn't see any animosity from them towards us, and I, the GIs were just there to have fun, yeah. so they. They didn't have any animosity. They're glad enough that uh, uh, those Japanese girls were friendly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that uh, 
that was pretty much the way that was. Well, that must have been, I mean, up to this point, a pretty amazing experience because you alluded earlier, you know, just a farm boy from North Dakota, and, and like many of your generations, growing up never really traveled too far away from home. Now you're in Kentucky and then Seattle, across the ocean, Japan, Korea. That must have been a fascinating experience. Uh, yes, it, it, it was uh, quite an eye-opener for a person uh, who was... Um, Social experience were pretty limited. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it uh, uh, it was, uh, and then uh, after the war ended, there was not really much going on. Uh, the twenty, the second I was involved with the second pork chop hill, and that was the sixth of July, nineteen fifty three. And that, there's a book out about it called the Pork Chop Hill, The Last Big Battle of the War. And my company, A Company, 17th Regiment, was on Pork Chop Hill occupying it the night of July 6th when the Chinese overran us. Mm. And uh, there were two more companies came up and reinforced in the t course of the night. And uh, about 10, 11 o'clock the next morning, the word was passed around for the people of A Company, 7th, 17th Regiment, to, in military terms, they say, fall back to the rear, which means just get the hell off the hill, basically. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we assembled in the back at regimental headquarters, and there were actually six of us who walked off wow. the hill out of about, uh, roughly, 140. Gee. You know, a full strength unit was maybe 142. It might have been 138 in that. And um, now, not all of these people were killed. Yeah. In the court, the war, that battle lasted Tuesday. I can still remember. Tuesday, the 6th of July through Friday. On Friday, the U.S. abandoned the hill, and from then, until the war ended, it was pummeled every day by the Air Force and the Navy bombers, and no one occupied it. But uh, in the course of that time, the Chinese lost probably three, 4,000. And the U.S., according to that book, uh, Pork Chop Hill, The Last Big Battle of the War, they estimated that the KIA killed in action was about 250, and the wounded were about 850 in the course of that uh, four days. And of course, the people who I was with uh, who were wounded uh, were evacuated to Japan. And when they regained their health to the point they could travel, they were sent home. So they never came back. So the, the six of us who survived that <clears throat> have never known who the one our friends were that were killed and wow. who was wounded. Wow. wow. And I have one uh, particular guy. His name, all I ever knew him by was Buck, and he was from the, the uh, North Woods of Minnesota. And he and I were kind of struck it off because I'm from North Dakota yeah, and he's yeah. from Minnesota. <clears throat> and Buck was a very, very uh, good soldier. He never advanced beyond a private first class. But I have a, an experience. Uh, now, as you can see, I have the Bronze Star. Mm -hmm. And uh, I received that from Major General Arthur G. Trudeau, the commanding general of the, of the 7th Division. But the most meaningful thing that I wear is the combat infantryman's badge. Right, right. To me, that's more meaningful than anyone's individual uh, decoration because only people who serve on the, in frontline infantry are eligible for it. And I'll give you an example of why I feel so strongly about it. Uh, it was customary uh, when you're up on like Pork Chop Hill, that about once or twice a week, a small group of seven or eight people were sent out at night. There was a big valley uh, on the south side, 
was the United Nations people on the north side were the Chinese, and there was probably two miles across that valley. And uh, so a couple times a week or once, these small patrols were sent out just to kind of probe and see what was going on. And we had this big Mormon medic. He was a giant. He was like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, maybe 260. And, and he was a conscientious object, objector, didn't want to fire a rifle, but he was a very heroic person because the medics carried no weapon yeah, and they were right. right there with him. Right. He carried a stretcher. Well, he had to go out on every one of these patrols. Well, if we had 140 men in our company and you only send out seven or eight, well, your chat, you know, you only had to go out on one every seven, eight times mm -hmm. or more. So, uh, and it was customary, they'd go out at night and they were supposed to be back in by daylight. Well, as it approached daylight this morning, <coughs> uh, we started hearing small arms fire and the patrol had run into some Chinese and one of the guys were wounded. <coughs> and uh, we were, Porkchop Hill is up high and so we could look down into the valley and the side of the hill, we called them fingers that run down from the hill. And uh, so as we looked down there, here was this medic with the guy, one guy that was wounded. And of course he can't carry this guy on his stretcher. He's got him laying on the stretcher. And uh, the other guys were busy engaged in, in small arms fire with the Chinese. And so it's kind of like watching a movie. You could sit up there and watch what's taking place mm. right down a few hundred yards below you. And Buck, without any uh, instruction from anybody, I'm sitting there and I hadn't been there long. So I'm a rookie, I'm yeah. a private. Right, yeah. And in the service, anyone who has one stripe more than you do, you do what they're told of. Well, I'm sitting watching and all of a sudden somebody slaps me on the shoulder and it's Buck. He says, let's go. And he put his weapon down in the trench beside it, jumped over the edge and started running down this hill towards this wounded guy and the medic. And uh, of course, I didn't know. The guy told me, let's go, yeah. so I'd jump out and follow him. Well, we probably set a record for running down that <laughs> hill in combat boots. By the time we got down there, the medic had this guy on the stretcher, and he grabbed the foot end of it, which is lighter, of course, because a person's body mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And Buck and I each grabbed one of the handles on the front of the stretcher, and we set a record probably getting back up that hill as well. And uh, uh, we got back in unscathed. There, there were a few rounds fired in our direction. And here's a private first class who, on his own uh, ingenuity and, and, and good sense, caused this wounded guy to be back in the trenches safely yeah. before the company commander and the officer could formulate a plan to decide what to do. Yeah. And yet there was no decoration for that. I, you know, as soon as we were back, it was just another day at, uh, another day at the ranch, so to speak. And there's no high fives or a big thing. It was just, that was a part of mm. the, the day. And that's the reason that I feel so strongly about the combat infantryman's badge. Because I was fortunate enough to have been singled out and received this commendation, but there are thousands of people who did things like Buck did. Right. Spur of the moment, do what's needed, no fanfare, and no one ever knows about it because when all hell breaks loose, you know, there aren't a lot of people standing around there with a pad and pencil <laughs> recording what people do in the line of heroic action. So to me, if a man, and at that time there's only men in the yeah. service, if a man is wearing the combat infantryman's badge, he's got my respect. Wow, wow. 
utmost respect. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Because he probably did dozens of heroic acts that were never recorded. Yeah. And the other side of it is, you know, a lot of the people who saw the things that he did, who might have talked about it after, never made it. You mm. know, I mean, yeah. so uh, who's who are the witnesses? Were there any witnesses? Right, and, right. And so, uh, uh, to me, uh, there's nothing as meaningful. Well, I've always understood too when when you're in battle that obviously you're very patriotic and you're serving your country, but at, at that point in time you're looking out for each other it's it's more oh yeah, yeah it's you're, yeah you're there to take care of each other you always knew that if there was anybody left your back was covered yeah uh, yeah hmm. and if you were wounded you weren't going to get left behind wow yeah. so uh, and and those again are people who are endangering themselves immensely to look out for someone else but who never receive any you know you can't write up a declaration for everybody. And unfortunately, and most people really, they weren't there to get decorations. Right, 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 right. So. Uh, well, do you mind talking about how you were, uh, why you were awarded the bronze and the story behind that? Well, we were on a, an outpost uh, that was uh, probably just a few hundred yards. It was on the north side of this valley I mentioned. Just a few hundred, you could we, actually on a summer's night, you could hear the Chinese talking and mm. activity going on over. And uh, we were only like a platoon. I mean, they could have overrun us anytime they wanted to. I don't know why they didn't. But every now and then they'd send people out. And, and anyway, uh, one evening they did. Uh, attack us and in the course of the evening we managed to fend them off and and things happened in the course of that evening that uh, the platoon leader who was with us at the time thought warranted uh, some recognition so mm. uh, that's how it was funny little story about that there's a this second lieutenant lieutenant Barr was and he was mentioned in this uh, book, uh, Pork Chop Hill, The Last Big Battle of the War. So I know he survived. He was one of those who were wounded and survived. But uh, he was just new, rookie. And at night, the Chinese were great at uh, propaganda. So they'd hook up an old uh, loudspeaker and play uh, some of the uh, songs, current songs from back home, and then a lady would get on usually and say, you know, we don't have any quarrel with you uh, soldiers. Uh, you don't want to be there, we don't want to be here. Uh, so if you just give up your officer, if we come over and you just give up your officer, uh, we won't bother the rest of you. Well, he, he heard this and we weren't real fond of him. He came <laughs> in and didn't, most of the good officers came in and said to the non-coms, you know, you know what you're doing, you keep on doing it, I'll watch. And when I think I've learned enough so I can contribute something, I'll put in my two cents worth. Well, he immediately thought he knew how to run a combat outfit, which he didn't know anything about. And so we, for fun, to torment the guy, we would pretend we didn't see him coming up and and we would be conversing among us and maybe we should just turn turn him over to the Chinese. <laughs> and I think he got pretty nervous in the course of the time we were there, <laughs> wondering whether or not if the Chinese came, <laughs> if we weren't gonna just turn him over. <laughs> but then one other funny story about this guy. Then we're up on Porkchop Hill he just gotten there. And the mail clerk, that was another story. He, this mail clerk was a wonderful young man, but he was a guy who absolutely, when all hell broke loose, he just, he was as helpless as a child. He was just like, he wasn't 
what we would call a yellow belly. He wasn't a coward. He just became totally immobilized. Mm. And so about this time, the mail clerk that was there transferred home and the company commander came to me and said, who do you think we should make the mail clerk? And I said, I know just the guy. Well, this guy was so grateful. I mean, every day when, you know, the mail clerk stays back in the rear with the company commander's Jeep driver and the cooks, but came up every day with the mail. And I mean, he always stopped by and talked to me. I mean, he would just kiss my boots for getting him uh -huh. off, you know. Well, this guy, this Lieutenant Barr was from Evansville, Indiana. And I, I took my basic training in, in uh, uh, Kentucky, 40 miles away, so that was the town we went to on the weekend. Well, it turns out that this guy, Lieutenant Barr, was actually down in Fort Benning, Georgia, becoming a 90-day wonder at the time that I was there. And we discussed it, because I talked about with him about Evansville, yeah, you know, yeah, our yeah. hometown. Well, this particular day, this guy had been there a couple of weeks, and his mail finally caught up with him. And every evening, just before dark, the platoon leaders, the you know, the the, the officers and the non-coms get together, and and the, and the mail clerk would actually physically bring up the password for the night. And uh, so that information was passed, and and he and I saw when the mail clerk came up that this lieutenant got quite a little mail, so, and he was engaged to this girl. Well, it just so happened that we were sitting in a circle, and where he started, I was sitting on his left, but w after the information about the password and stuff had gone through, uh, he then wanted to show everybody a picture of his fiance, Good looking blonde gal, as I remember. And he started off to his right, so it came, you know, and each guy looked at, yeah, good looking, yeah, good looking, <laughs> around me. When I got it, uh -oh. I looked at it and kept looking at it just long enough so it became obvious. And then I turned to him and I said, say, is she from Evansville, Indiana? Well, I knew from, yeah, he says, what do you know about her? I said, oh, nothing. <laughs> I just tormented that guy with, <laughs> he thought forever that when he was at Camp, uh, or Fort Benning, Benning yeah. that I'd been seeing his girlfriend. <laughs> and of course, couldn't be farther from the truth. Yeah. And uh, so he, he was uh, constantly trying, every time I'd be alone somewhere, he was uh, constantly trying to buttonhole me about any information about his fiance, which of course I had none. <laughs> but so he's a rookie and we're out on this uh, T-Bone Hill, which is close to the Chinese position. And at night, the tanks sitting up on the south hill on the south side of this valley would lob rounds out onto the Chinese. And when you're sitting on this hill where we we're at, it really sounded like they weren't going to clear the hill. I mean, if you didn't know what it was. So we're out there and it's muddy and he's up there now and he's kind of looking pretty good yet because he had some clean stuff, you know. <laughs> and that's muddy. And, and uh, about nine o'clock, just about the time it got dark every night, the tanks would start firing. Well, if you're looking back there, you could see the fire from the muzzle of the cannon on the tank, and it took a little while for the rounds to get there. You'd see them flash. And, and I pulled the dirtiest trick of all on him that he's there again, trying to get information from me about his fiance. <laughs> and I look back there and see the flash of fire from these cannon. And I know that, and it sounds, I, we used to laugh and say it sounded like an outhouse going over, you know, because it go, those rounds going over you. So as soon as that happened, I faked like I was going to hit the ground, you know, hit the dirt, and man, he went head first in the mud, you know, and he gets up wiping himself off, and he knows again. I just decoyed him in, going head first in the mud. But he could never, I actually, you know, I was a field first sergeant, so he couldn't, he couldn't go to the company commander and claim. In fact, I had a kid from Tommy Marler that I went to high school with, who I was in the 17th Regiment of the 7th Division, and Tommy was in the 31st. Hmm. So we pulled back one day, 
uh, for two or three days off the line. And uh, after breakfast, I went over to the company commander and asked if by chance I could go over and see my friend from my hometown. Oh gosh, he said, I don't have any Jeeps. Oh, I said, take mine. So he called his driver over and had his driver. Well, I didn't know it, but this Lieutenant Barr had been trying to get a Jeep from him before I had. And the company commander <laughs> turned him down and gave me his Jeep. So this Barr did not have a, a real affinity for me. Yeah. <clears throat> and I didn't like him either. So, so there was a lot of uh, kind of interesting interchanges between them. <laughs> so there was some humor. Yeah, right, right. Well, talk about a little bit, what's it like, uh, particularly like someone myself and many that will watch this that have never been in battle, what's it like to be in the thick of battle? I just, I can't fathom what it, uh, it just seems so unnatural. And Oh, yeah. Uh, well, the first thing is, you know, you've got a job to do. But the second thing is, you know, is... Uh, you have a personal obligation to your unit and to yourself yeah. to uh, do the best you can to survive. <clears throat> and, of course, be responsible for your fellow soldiers and all that. And it's terrifying. Anybody that says that it isn't is, I, I'll say, is a bald-faced liar. Yeah. I mean, it, it's an experience that you can't imagine. Hmm. I mean, you know, and... Uh, so uh, uh, it's 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 a, it's it's quite an experience to look back on. I wouldn't want to do it again. But uh. well, looking back on it, and, and <clears throat> I usually ask this a little bit further on in the interview. Uh, coming home and after all you'd been through, did did you you know today we've got the PTSD and and such. Did you experience any of that coming home as far as nightmares or flashbacks or? You know the funny thing, and this is one of the things, and <clears throat> I know I should be more tolerant, but I have a hard time with present day veterans, and I because they haven't gone through any more hell than we did, yeah. and you know the big war was World War Two, that was a really tough one. And, you know, people came back from World War II, took their uniform off and went to work, and no one ever heard of coddling those people for it. Same way with the Korean veteran. Then all of a sudden, after Vietnam, it became fashionable that these people ha were going to turn up with all these problems. Now, I'll grant you, I wouldn't have liked to have been in, in those swamps and, and uh, circumstances in Vietnam, but... Uh, Korea was wasn't a bowl of cherries either, right, yeah. and of course World War II, uh, those people, particularly in the Pacific, because the Japanese were absolutely barbaric. Uh, so it was it's hard for me to. I'm sympathetic to those people. I went through it, but you know, the people of my vintage and earlier <clears throat> never thought about it. Society owing them anything. They're just damn glad to be home and uh, shook loose. Wow. But I, I will relate one thing that's kind of <clears throat> I'll never forget. Because on this farmhouse, you know, the heating system, and there wasn't any insulation, and we slept upstairs, and in the wintertime, you had piled on a lot of clo uh, quilts, and, and you slept under the blanket. You know, your head and everything, yeah, just yeah, pull it over yeah. your head. And so I got, I had that habit. So I got home and I was discharged the 1st of May. And uh, so pretty soon in the summertime, while well, I'm laying in bed up there just with a sheet on, but even though it was just a sheet on, it was my habit to always pull it over my head. <laughs> <clears throat> and I can remember waking up in the middle of the night with a dream, kind of a nightmare type mm -hmm. thing. And laying there in bed, and I know I'm in my bed. But you didn't, like when you're on the, those patrols, you didn't want to make any noise. So I'm laying there in bed thinking, I know I'm in my bed. And I I just moved my hand a little bit until I could feel the headboard or something. So, yeah, I am in my wow. bed. Wow. <laughs> but that's really the only. And then 
that summer I came down with malaria. I didn't know that I had uh, contracted malaria because when I was in Korea, every Sunday the medic came around and gave you a quinine tablet, and of course that suppressed it. Well, I get home, I don't know, I have it, and I'm not taking quinine. Well, all of a sudden, I'm getting these terrible headaches and, and fever. And finally, I went to a doctor in Minot who'd been in the Far East during World War II, and he said, you've got malaria, get over to the hospital. And I, weighed, I can remember I weighed 196 pounds when I was discharged. That's the heaviest I've ever been in my <laughs> life. And uh, I went over to the hospital, and you get the chills and the, and the ache in the neck and the back of your head, and then you get the fever. And when I got the fever, I think they said, you know, I've got up as high as 106, which is almost fa fatal and maybe ex explains some <laughs> something happened to my brain <laughs> in the course of time too. But in any event, they would, the nurses would actually change the sheets on my bed and they could almost wring water out. And so when I left the hospital, I was down like to close to 160 pounds. I'd lost like 30 some pounds just a few days and it was all perspiration basically. So I can remember I, my parents were gonna, I was gonna get discharged on Saturday morning and this town of mine out where the hospital is, about 35 miles from our farm. So my parents were coming up and family on Friday night to visit me. So I said, well, you know, the day I got back from the service, I bought a new car. And so I had a car and uh, I said, well, bring my car up and park it in front of the hospital. Tomorrow when they turn me loose, I'll just drive home. Well, Valva, this little town, which is our town, was like 22 miles east of mine. So I got discharged, got in my car, and I had to stop in Valva and rest for a while. I couldn't drive hmm. the other 12 miles home. It had taken that much that out of me. Well, anyway, I took my quinine during the summer and then when the cold weather hits, the malaria doesn't bother you. It's just a hot weather thing. So I'd have my quinine in the medicine chest and when spring came and I'd feel that headache coming on, I'd start taking quinine pills. And after about seven to 10 years, I can't tell you, it just wore itself out and it's never, but to this day, they won't take my blood because I, had malaria. Right, right. So I can't contribute. But, but it's never flared up since? <clears throat> never flared up since. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let me jump back to, to the front lines. Uh, your time on the front lines, one thing that, once again, I, I can't comprehend. I mean, you're up on the front lines, you're, you're out in the elements, uh, you're probably not eating so well, you're not sleeping very well, hygiene's not very well. Uh, uh, all those, I think, each one of those could, could bring a man down by themselves, but you've got all of those coupled with the stress of war on top of that. How do you think you made it through that time period? <laughs> well, there wasn't much in the line of alter alternatives, yeah. <laughs> you know. And one thing that war did teach me is that it's almost incomprehensible the misery that a human body can endure. Mm -hmm. You just can't believe it. And uh, of course, there's humorous things that happen in the course of these, even up on the front lines, you know, we found things to laugh about. You think that's what kept you going as well, the humor, keeping the humor? Uh, yeah, but, that, yeah, you know, uh, camaraderie. Yeah. And uh, now and then, you know, people get letters from home and a joke and we'd share their jokes and get a little laugh out of something like that. But yeah, there was, there, it was not uh, uh, like, camping out. In fact, I've never camped out since. I said once my idea of camping out, there's got to be a indoor plumbing attached to my camping. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, I never cared for that. But uh, uh, the other thing that was kind of interesting was the night the war ended. Yes, tell that story. Well, it was very, very disconcerting. And I think Tell you the truth, I've been a lifelong Republican, and the, and the thing probably that 
made me a Republican more than anything else was Ike. When he took over as president in 1954, everybody felt that he carried enough sway as a general that the communists were going to pay some attention to him. And he did get the war stopped. But in the course of the summer, early June, the rumor has it that we were like two, three days from a ceasefire. And then it would flare up again. And then it would flare up again. Well, had that taken place, you know, the thousand people who were killed or injured on Pork Chop Hill would never have transpired. Yeah, yeah. So we got to the point where we just didn't believe, you know, they said non, the ceasefire is going to be, well, we just kind of snicker. Anyway, it was supposed to stop at 9 o'clock on the 27th of July, and we're sitting up there, and there's activity going on. They're shelling us. And I swear they kept it up till about a quarter to nine. It was supposed to stop at nine o'clock. And all of a sudden at nine o'clock, there was this silence. And I've never experienced anything like that silence. I mean, it's the loudest silence. It was like drums beating and it was silent. Huh. And all of a sudden you could hear crickets, you know. Like, oh, there are crickets here, <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, an unbelievable experience when it finally did happen. Wow, wow. that must have been a, a sense of relief, I can't imagine. <laughs> well, that. it was, but it was such a feeling of anguish because of all those people yeah. who were unnecessarily killed yeah. and maimed. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And then you said, uh, with the ceasefire, you still stayed on then. To continue your story yeah. after the ceasefire, you stayed on yeah. until the following March. Yeah, well, you know, the the army is still over there. Yeah. So, you know, now I'm only getting like one point a month or something where I used to get four. Well, anyway, uh, I think early in March of 54, I went home and I got home, I think about the first of April for 30 day leave and then went back to Camp Stillman, California and was discharged on the first day of May 1954. So uh, uh, that's kind of the story and, of what transpired. And, and, and the backside of my, an earlier question, how was that transformation for you then or that transition going from being in the army and everything you just experienced over in Korea now back into into civilian life was that much of an adjustment for you or not a bit is that right yeah. not a bit yeah <laughs> it's like would you like an ice cream cone yeah i'd like an ice cream cone or, yeah. or you know i mean yeah and i was anxious to get home because again i was planning to go back on the farm right yeah and springs work is going big time well it turned out i remember i drove back from camp stillman and the night I got home, it started snowing and they had a big blizzard and we didn't get back in the fields up there until middle of May. <laughs> but I, I'll tell you another funny story. <clears throat> when we got back to Camp Stoneman, there was a group of us from that area across North Dakota and we came back by train. And you've heard of the Empire Builder, it mm -hmm. goes from Chicago to Seattle. Well, we caught a train from from uh, San Francisco up to Seattle and then the Empire Builder across. And on the way home, I think there were five of us from the general area. And we decided we didn't want to take the train back. We wanted to drive back. Well, I said, well, I'm buying a new car. And I can remember I got home on Sunday night on, on that furlough. And Monday morning by 10, I'd bought a new car <laughs> in this little town of Alva. I had a new Chevy. <laughs> and um, so we met. Then at the end of the time, we met in Bismarck, which was 100 miles south of where our farm was. And they came in from various parts of the state. And we met there and drove back. And the deal was everybody would pay $50 to the person who furnished the car. Well, it was a pretty good deal. I was going back anyway. But I got 200 bucks out of it, you know, and gas was 15 cents a gallon at that time. So anyway, now we, we get to uh, Reno, Nevada. And those of us, there's one guy who was an RA, he was going to stay in the service. 
So he was wearing a Class A uniform like I have on now. And the rest of us were in our civvies, but we had some, some uh, army clothes to wear for the few days we were going to be in Camp Soma until we got released, you know. Yeah. They give you physical exams and all that kind of stuff. So back in those days, <clears throat> it was considered you had to change oil on your car every thousand miles. So we get to Reno, and I know I'm probably going to spend most of my money in the casinos and everything. <laughs> so we get there late in the afternoon. I have the oil changed in my car, fill a tank with gas, and I know I can get to Cam Stillman from Reno on a tank of gas. <laughs> well, the next morning, sure enough, we're all broke. <laughs> But this one fellow who was the RA, uh, and he was the only guy that hadn't paid. Unfortunately, I wish the other guys hadn't paid too. I'd have had some money left over. <laughs> but he hadn't paid. He was not going to pay until he was delivered, I guess, back to San. So now we've got no money for breakfast or anything else, but we've got gas and we've got. So uh, he said, Well, that's no problem. He said, I've got. A $50 money order in my pocket. I was going to, you know, keep to pay you. I'll go cash that money order. Well, we all thought that's great. We're walking down the street, you know. I think he and another fellow or two were walking ahead of us, and then two or three behind. Nice sunny morning in, in uh, Reno. And I'm looking, he's wearing that heavy OD pants. Every time he steps, there's some white flashes on the seat of his pants. I said, what the dickens you got on the seat of your pants? He reached back there, had a big hole in the seat of his pants. Somebody, when he was sitting on a, a bar stool, obviously used a razor blade or something like it, cut, the, cut through his pants, slipped his billfold out, and, and now he doesn't have his billfold or his $50 money order. So now we are, we are broke. So, well, we know when we get back to camp, and it isn't that far, we'll get fed. And so we go get in the car, and we thought, well, we ought to turn it in to the cops because he'd like to get his billfold back if they found it. Well, I'm a farm kid. I never heard of a one-way street, so we're looking for the police station. I'm walking down or driving down the street the wrong way, unaware of it, and meet this cop car, and they put the lights on and stop me. And I said, you know, roll down the window. I said, hey, it's good. We're, we're looking for the police department. Can you take us to the police department? Because I knew I had to. And he said, yeah, well, I can take you there. And he recognized we were a bunch of, yeah, I, I can take you there. But he said, you should be aware that you're driving the wrong way on a one-way street. Well, I said, one way to help you find the cops. <laughs> anyway, if you go the wrong way on a one-way street. So anyway, we got back to Gam Stillman. That was our little episode on the way back. <laughs> uh, so you get uh, mustered out, uh, take your story now, post, uh, post-war military years. Yep, well, went home, put in the crop, uh, went to, uh, started college in the fall. Now, is that where you met your wife, or had you known her prior to? No, no, yeah. no. And uh, we met in college, and I started college, and we met, got married, had... Uh, you know, four wonderful children, and um, eventually we were divorced after 23 years. Um, but in the course of that time, I I uh, got my degree in accounting. Never practiced, started yeah. uh -huh. business, and um, then uh, you know, life just. Uh, I always maintain that most people don't have a plan in life they follow. I say they follow their nose. They get a job here and getting a job there leads to a job over or whatever. Well, I got my degree and by turning down U.S. Steel, I ended up self-employed and, and I became very active in the community of Minot, which is the fourth largest town in North Dakota, but it's only 30,000 yeah. or so. <laughs> and uh, had a good life there. Then came down here in 1990, and I've enjoyed Colorado. The choice at, at that time was I was going to leave North Dakota. My oldest daughter lived in Grand Forks, which is on the Minnesota border. And my son was still living in Minot at that time. And I had a daughter who lived here in Fort Collins and another one in Sacramento. And I visited here in Sacramento. And 
it was kind of an easy choice for me to pick Colorado. Yeah, yeah. And um, I've lived here ever since and been very happy. No, oh, very good. And from uh, earlier conversation, four children, 12 grandchildren, two great grandchildren. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very fortunate. Yeah, very good. They're all very healthy and, and uh, I think quite happy and, and they afford me a great deal of happiness. Oh, wonderful. So, uh, you know, I guess that's about where we're at. Yeah, okay. Uh, you had mentioned, uh, I usually ask this question, I think you'd answered it earlier. Uh, through the years, did you ever keep in touch with any of the guys you served with? And there's never been any sort of reunions or anything like that? Well, I have a good friend. I don't know if you're familiar with Alan Plumbing here in town. Mm -hmm. Well, Marion, the founder, is a good friend of mine. We hunted together for 15 years. And, <clears throat> and he was always talking to me about his reunions. And and he said, don't you ever go to a reunion? I said, well, there wasn't any of us. You know, no one kept it. You know, the people in, in Korea, I don't know, I don't think half the people there were spoken to by their name. Oh, you know, right, yeah. There was a guy from Arkansas, he was Arky, and, yeah. and uh, gotcha. everybody had a nickname. And uh, this guy from northern Minnesota was Buck. And uh, I'd give anything if I could get in touch with him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, there. Why go to a reunion if there's nobody there? That yeah, there sure. was a guy named Harold, one of the guys that walked off the hill with me. Uh, he was from Georgia, or Alabama. He was a a pretty funny guy. One of the funny stories. Uh, there were, as I said, only six of us, so they basically brought recruits in and restocked. Yeah, yeah. And they sent us up on a holding position behind pork chop, took the experienced people off the line there, used them, you know, reassigned them up there. And so, but, uh, Harold, what the, Orville Harold, I think his name was, and I, um, and others, we were in charge of these recruits who didn't know north from south. They didn't know, if they got nervous, they probably panicked and ran them straight north into <laughs> China. But, uh, it was pretty comical. We hadn't slept, you know, in a period of time. And so I talked to my guys there and I thought, well, I'll go down and see what Harold's doing. And he's got a group assembled there that he's trying to put together um, who could be like leaders. And uh, of course, he's got the Southern drawl, y'all boys. And I come down and I, I just kind of sneak up behind him and listen to the conversation. And it was so funny because people didn't sneak off and run. I don't know of any case. But anyway, it was a little of his humor. And he said to him, well, you all boys, he said, if you if all hell breaks loose and you decide to clear out of here, he says, I'm going to be sleeping. He says, wake me up so you don't leave me behind. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that wasn't going to happen yeah. anyway. But he, it was his little humor. Yeah. Uh, hmm. A lot of you, you know, the Korean veteran in the Korean War has been called the forgotten veteran, the yep. forgotten war. What are your thoughts on, on that uh, through the years? And, and well, it doesn't bother me, except as I pointed out, you know, we came back and there was no big to do about yeah. it. And like I have, I'm going to be going to Washington, D.C. on Sunday and Monday and visit all these uh Muse or, uh, memorials. Memorials. And it does kind of irritate me that uh, the Vietnam Wall is, is such a big deal. And, I, and the Korean uh, memorial is, to me, kind of a farce. Hmm. Uh, it wasn't, it's, it's supposed to depict some of these men out on patrol, mm -hmm. like I was telling mm -hmm. you about. But, like I said, to my family when we visited several years ago, uh, there, w there wasn't any patrol that ever operated in the manner that was depicted oh, really? there. Oh, yeah. wow. Whoever put that together obviously had no frontline experience. Uh, but uh, 
I was very impressed with the World War II Memorial. And uh, no, I'm not upset about anything. Okay. I'm ha I survived. What more could I ask? Yeah, about? right, right. right. Uh, and and unimpaired, never never got a scratch. And I liken that to being out in a rainstorm without an umbrella and staying dry. Hmm. Yeah, mean, right. Yeah, it's just about that far fetched. Right, right. And so, uh, you know, how could I not be just uh, thankful? Yeah, right. Wow. Well, as we we wind down this interview, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about or any of the stories that have kind of floated to the top as we've been sitting here? So ideally, we, we cover your story as best we can, or, or do you think we've uh, pretty much got it? I think we've uh, uh, put it pretty much uh, covered it. I see you have a question. Did you get enough sleep? Well, we never slept at night. Oh, I got a funny story, once again, true story. We would be assigned a group of uh, South Koreans, not many. Mm -hmm. And at the time that I was there, the army was just getting integrated. There were very few colored Oh, right, troops. yes, right, sure. Uh, probably uh, in an average company company of 140, you might have six or seven blacks. And that, once again, must have been interesting for you growing up in North Dakota, probably yeah. no, no interaction I, hardly, with yeah. I mean, black people were absolutely foreign to me. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but these Koreans, and they're, we call them ROCs because it stood for R O Republic of Korea, mm -hmm. ROK. So these guys would get assigned to us and they couldn't speak English or anything else. And of course, every day the the uh, you got a little package of sea ration. Mm -hmm. It was a day's food, mm -hmm. and uh, they had various things in them. <clears throat> the world's worst was ham and lima beans. Oh. It was oh, it was awful. The best was a little can of fruit. Well, being the first Saturday night, I had to hand out this fruit or food, well, these rocks didn't know the difference and they were emaciated little skinny guy. So I'd take, if I got ham and lima beans, I'd take it out and put it in one of theirs and take the fruit. <laughs> well, apparently somewhere along the line, they spoke with uh, some of the, their ilk that had been there a little longer and, and came to realize that ham and lima beans wasn't the only thing in sea rice. And I'll never forget, it was early in the morning, just turned daylight, and we had, we'd pass out the sea rations, and, and uh, people would eat their breakfast, so to speak, and then they'd go to sleep for the rest of the day. And I, and I would, was walking along the top of the trenches and, and had these boxes, and I threw this one down, you know, he's below, you know, three feet below, and he catches it and he immediately ripped open the box and looked and he grabs that can of lima, ham and lima beans and, and threw it back to me with a favorite GI expletive. <laughs> and so from then on I knew I, I couldn't foist off my ham and lima beans on him <laughs> and take his fruit. That's kind of a dirty pool. Yeah. The other thing that was interesting I didn't smoke, and if you can believe it, nowadays it'd be uh, criminal. But the government gave everybody a pack of cigarettes in their sea ration, so I would give my cigarettes. You, I could have kept them and sold them in kind of a black market thing mm -hmm. when we mm -hmm. went back to the rear, but I gave them to the rock soldiers because you know they would trade them off, and those people were in such poverty anyway. Right. But every time we'd go back to the rear, those rock soldiers would take my laundry and their mama sons would, and I had the best looking laundry of anybody there. Oh, because excellent. They got my cigarettes and I got clean laundry. Yeah. <laughs> so that was yeah. kind of nice. Hmm. Now with, with, the, with the war being a multinational UN thing, did you have any interaction with any other nationalities at all? Yeah, uh, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, the Turks and the Ethiopians hmm. were 
pretty much located near us. And they're both wonderful soldiers. In fact, the Chinese were scared to death of them. The best thing you could have is for the Turks and the Ethiopians to be close to you because the Chinese didn't want to bother with them at yeah. all. I had a classmate, I've told you about this other classmate that was in the 31st mm -hmm. uh, uh, Regiment, but I had a classmate who was the, uh, he was a student manager for all the athletic stuff and I played sports in high school. He was in the Air Force and he was stationed down at Kimpo Field, which is just on the north side, north edge of Seoul. Mm -hmm. So one of these days we ca we came back and had a couple days off. So I asked the company commander if I could go down there and he said, yeah, but you have to hitchhike. Well, that was an experience. I'm out there hitchhiking and these two Turks come along in a U.S. Jeep. And these Turks are like 6'3", every yeah, one of yeah. them, about 230. And they're very friendly, and they all carried they carried a knife on their side. And the interesting thing about that, you ask them, see, they take their knife out of the sheath and let you look at it. But before they put it back in the sheath, they cut themselves. They always drew blood yeah. if they took that knife out of that right. sheath. <laughs> but anyway, they picked me up, and what an experience! I'm sitting in the back seat. The only thing they knew for sure is they kept the pedal to the metal. And whatever gear they were in, it was as fast as it could go. I mean, we're bouncing around those roads. And I thought, you know, this trip down to Seoul is more hazardous than being up on the front line. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't tip it over. Wow, wow. And the, the Ethiopians were uh, pretty good, too. Hmm. And uh, so, but they were very small contingents. They were just like... 500 men. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake, the U.S. bore the burden. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, the last question I like to ask in these interviews is, how do you think that experience uh, changed your life, played a role in your life, affected your life, or did it? Or was it just simply just a chapter in your life you went through? How would you, how would you, how would you answer that? Well, it's a chapter in my life uh, that I'm very proud of. Uh, I think I did a good job. I think I was uh, uh, supportive of my country. Um, I think I represented my country well. Um, it's a huge source of pride to me. But I never felt any scar from it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I, now, some people probably say I'm hard. I don't know how hard I am. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know I, the one wonderful thing the Army taught me was discipline. You know, the Army has a saying, the difference between an army and a mob is one word, discipline. And... Uh, the Army taught me the importance and the usefulness of discipline. And, you know, I... A, a discipline you don't think you had back from the farm life? I mean, didn't you, did you think you had, didn't you have that ingrained in you from an early life or yeah, is something different? Responsibility. Yeah, responsibility. Yeah. But that was just an extension of it. Yeah. But, you know, the interesting thing, if you got in trouble, like basic training or whatever, if you made an, there would be a particular penalty. Mm. And if you just kept your mouth shut and said, no excuse, sir, that's the penalty you'd get. But if you tried to make an excuse and get out of it, the penalty would be compounded. So if you got in trouble, keep your mouth shut, mm -hmm. just do what you're told and take your medicine, whether you, whether you deserve it or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... You know, that's something that everybody could use in their own lives. Accept your responsibility. Right, right. Uh, sometimes uh, the deck's not even, but in the long run, uh, just standing up and, and uh, doing what's right and not whining and complaining uh, is probably the best. Uh, and it's probably the best lesson I learned from the service. Wow. Oh, wow. And I'm grateful for it. Yeah. Wow. 
Well, with that, we'll uh, we'll close down this interview. I want to thank you for uh, sitting down to tell your story today, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. That's me when I finished basic training at Camp Breckenridge, Kentucky in 1952. This is a picture of a sign out in front of the command post in the rear showing the 17th Regiment of the 7th Division called, it was known as the Buffalo Regiment and this of course, says the finest buffalo of the herd, which depicted Co Company A, 17th Regiment, which was uh, my outfit. Here's a picture, apparently, the guy reading the paper was probably reading the Stars and Stripes, but uh, it's pretty hard to know. It's, it's kind of like a typical day up on the farm, or up on the front. Uh, the mail clerk probably... The other guy's reading a letter the way it looks, and a couple other people are reading some publications that they got. Now, were they, were they pretty regular about getting stuff up to you guys, mail and... Mail clerk came up every day. Yeah, okay. But it took a couple of weeks to get there. Well, the one question, or something you could talk about in, in today's... I mean, today we've got instant message and computers and cell phones. Talk about your options for communications back in the day. Well, it was just a letter, but let me make a little aside, this because this is very interesting. My birthday was the 12th of May. And my mother and sister-in-law made a cake and were going to send me a birthday cake. Well, when they took it into the post office in this little town of Russo, to send it airmail couldn't weigh more than a pound. And so it weighed a little bit too much. So they went home and made cupcakes. Of course, they didn't have a scale to weigh. So they brought these cupcakes into the post office and kept putting them in a box till they got up to a pound and sent them email. And you'll never believe it, they were delivered to me on the hill on the 12th of May. Really? Oh, yep. wow. My 21st birthday, the 12th of May, 1953, the cupcakes arrived on Porkchop Hill. Oh, what a wonderful story. <laughs> wow. It wasn't really getting ready for the dance, but <laughs> we did uh, try to keep ourselves uh, somewhat uh, clean. And, uh, of course, with all the filth around us, probably shaving was a good idea. God knows what might get in your in your beard. Yeah. I think this is me. Looks like it's kind of an oil change deal, sitting by the creek, uh, at least washing my feet. Uh, we used to, when we went up on the line, we'd take an extra pair of shorts and an extra pair of socks, and we'd try to guess how long we're going to be there. And when it got to be about half time, we'd change and throw away the ones that we that were dirty and. However long we stayed there from then on, we had to stick with the same shorts and socks. Oh, I don't remember who this might have been. Obviously, it was a part of my outfit, but he's in the process of uh, trying to get himself a little more presentable, and, and uh, you can see the facilities are a little marginal. Mm. This is one of several pictures of rock soldiers, Republic of Korea, this obviously is, is in, up on the line. You can see the b bunker in, in the background, and uh, he's one of the Korean soldiers. Here we must have been in, in the rear as a group of uh, rock soldiers as well as a couple of uh, GIs. I think they're both probably colored guys. They might have even been brothers. Hmm. Uh, we had uh, uh, the guy on the right uh, I'm sure name was Pat. The only thing I ever knew him by because his last name was Patterson. Mm -hmm. Here's another of the Korean guys standing uh, right almost at the entrance into one of those bunkers that we called hoochies. You can see the strings and stuff above it is, uh, is um, actually supposed to be camouflage. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Here's a picture of myself in the middle with my arms on the shoulders of two of the rocks who I'm sure were particular, I was particularly fond of. I grew to like those people. I admired them a lot because we could rotate home after a certain length of service on the front lines, but they were in for as long as the war lasted. Right. So yeah. they had a hard way to go. Hmm. 
Did you ever have a chance to travel back to Korea? Never. Okay. Never? Yeah. Any I desire to? It. What? Any desire to ever go back? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. Well, this would be a picture on the line again. You can see a huge hoochie in the background. But I think the most significant thing you see there is the flak, what we call a flak jacket, the armored vest. Hmm. And those things were miserable in the summertime. They were so hot. Hmm. I've seen a time my back would be blistered from them. But uh, there was an element of safety involved with them. The Chinese had a small caliber uh, uh, weapon that actually fired 980 rounds per, sec per minute. Uh, the GIs, because of the rapid fire of them, nicknamed them a burp gun, but they were of a small caliber, and actually, they might make it smart a little bit, but those burp gun rounds would not penetrate. Hmm. Wow. A flak jack. Here again, you can see myself on the right, and I don't know who that is on the left, but obviously we're standing at the door to one of those hoochies, and uh, you can see that he's wearing a flak jacket. I presume I probably was as well. Hmm. I guess you'd call this leisure time up <laughs> on the front. I'm uh, sitting on top of a bunch of sandbags, probably out in the sun, uh, passing the day. Again, you can see the flak jacket and the, and the steel pot. Hmm. Another picture of the, the camouflage and the general appearance of the area. Uh, must have recently shaved because it doesn't look too black there, but you can see, again, the, I'm wearing the flak jacket and the steel pot. I don't know who this is, but it looks like he just got back from the uh, stream. He looks pretty clean to me. <laughs> <laughs> this is myself with, with George Botto. He was from Philadelphia, graduate of LaSalle University. And you'll notice we've got our winter caps on. And if you look on the bill of my cap, I think you can make out the sergeant rank on there. Uh, in all the time I was in the, on the front lines, uh, no one ever put their rank on their uh, uniform because if you're captured, you didn't want them to think you're anybody but oh, right. yeah. uh, someone that didn't amount to much. Right. This is a picture of my buddy Buck, probably the closest friend I had from the Northwoods, Minnesota. He was either killed or wounded in the last battle of Porkchop. I've never been able to find out. I, I don't know his name or anything. I just knew him as Buck. Probably one of the finest soldiers I've ever known. Hmm. Another picture of Buck, and I will correlate this with one of my uh, stories uh, previously. Uh, he's the guy that came and slapped me on the shoulder and said, let's go, when we went down and got that wounded fellow. Hmm. This is obviously after the war ended. We're looking too clean for having been a part of the, of the uh, front lines. Uh, that fellow with me is Tommy Marler. He was a classmate of mine at Valva High School, and he was in the 31st Division of the Se or Regiment of the 7th Division, and I was able to go and visit him one day. Now, how did you know he was over there? Did just you know, my, my family uh, wrote and told me what... Tommy's address was. Okay. Here's just, just a picture of activity. I think behind these men is a truck. Might have been getting ready to be transported somewhere, but in any event, uh, that's kind of like what we look like on a daily basis. This is a picture of me in the center. On my right is a rock soldier named Kim. On my left, Lieutenant Barr who I've referenced before. He was a part of our company and was actually, uh, I was waiting in with them uh, for Major General Arthur G. Trudeau to arrive up on the front because the following picture will show me being presented by General Trudeau uh, the Bronze Star Medal. This is General Trudeau shaking my hand, uh, quite obviously, I guess, after the presentation. Uh, General Trudeau flew up 
to the front lines actually in his helicopter and probably that helicopter was parked about 100 yards away. Wow. So uh, uh, this was what they referred to in those times as an on-the-spot decoration where the commanding general comes in and makes the presentation quote unquote on the spot where things occurred. Uh, otherwise, you probably would have gotten it through normal channels and, and received it back in the rear from uh, uh, some other um, higher-ranking official. Wow. Oh, very good. That's it.